Mark, thank you so much for coming on The Creative Introvert. Thank you so much for having me, Kat. Yeah, I'm it's really been- excited to be here. It's been great to connect. We connected uh, initially over Instagram um, and me and my fellow co-host from the other podcast, The Seeker and the Skeptic, uh, have been admiring your work. And I was just saying before we got started that it feels like very much the essence of The Seeker and the Skeptic. Um, but we'll get into that in a little bit. My first question for you is, do you consider yourself to be an introvert? Oh, very much. Yeah, definitely. 100%, maybe 110%. <laughs> How did you figure that out? Like, have you always known that? or? Um, when I was a little kid, I um, had this friend over and we were hanging out and then he left and I was like, oh my God, I'm so happy. <laughs> this is so much better. <laughs> How can I always be alone? <laughs> no, I, I thought that was really weird too because he was cool and we were hanging out and it was fun and we were like 10 or maybe even younger. And, um, and I started doing this thing that was called, that I called, I'm surprised I even had a name for it when I was little, but I would call it playing privately. And my parents were like, what the hell are you doing? We're <laughs> taking you to a doctor. So they took me to a doctor and they were like, is everything okay with him? He is really weird. So what I would do is I would just like kind of lock myself in my room or like close my door and I would just pace around and think of like imaginary things. Right. Yeah, and I guess that's an introvert thing. Okay, so that, that's something that I definitely need to talk about more on the show because my most of my childhood, I don't really remember much of what happened. Like I don't think it was traumatic as far as I know because I was just in my imagination world the whole time. And I remember asking my sister once, what do you think of before you go to bed? Because I really liked going to bed because it meant that I could just be undisturbed from my imaginary world. <laughs> Even if I didn't like get to sleep, it's like, well, I, well I'm, I just get to think of things. And she was like, oh, I guess I just run through the day. Like how was school? And I'm like, oh, I have like another family in my head. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. I've got like another world. I can turn into all these cool like <laughs> beasts and animals and like, you know, I have friends, they're robots. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it doesn't have to go away when we're kids. I think this is something that I've been recent, more recently rediscovering and like reallowing myself to live in that world that I enjoyed so much as a kid. Um, I, you, we were talking a bit on Instagram about the idea of the daimon. This is an episode that I've recently put out. And part of that, my research into this daimon and uh, th this idea of this like inner guide and it takes various forms and different cultures and stuff but why would that have to not be I don't know not be real how, how can we kind of cultivate the idea of that in real life and it, I don't know for me it was like giving myself permission to to have that yeah I think I think that idea is so great um I love that episode by the way I listened to it yesterday while I was painting um yeah I mean I have I had a lot of different thoughts when I was listening to it. Have you ever heard of um, the idea of like thought forms and, or um, in like chaos magic, there is an idea called a servitor where you intentionally try to create and give your energy to um, like a daemon or, um, or something like that, except it, you, it's not choosing you, you're making it. Okay. Like you're really intentionally um, trying to create some, oh, tulpa is another idea or another name for it too. But you're trying to like actually make something that can help you and you kind of program it with energy and it does stuff for you. I, I think it'd be cool to have one. I don't have one, but That's it'd be cool. That's really interesting. So I had this recent, ex I love the whole idea of that. Um, I had this recent experience where I was on flying back, uh, flying back home on a long flight. And I said, I'm just going to let myself have this particular imagine, like imagination time where I imagine that I'm like, like living in some, it's kind of Lord of the Ringsy, but basically I have a spirit animal and I mentioned it on the show, but I was like, it's a snow fox. <laughs> and I spent like a lot of the time just really uh, very clearly imagining my life with this cool little uh, magical snow fox creature. I can't believe I'm talking about this. But but basically when I got off the flight and I got in, I met my dad and we got in the car and there was a fox right by the car. And I, my parents live in this city and it was so weird 
that a fox would be so close to the car. I mean, like mm, three meters away and whatever that translates to in feet, but it was freaky. We both kind of like sat in the car for a while, just like staring at it. Like, what's that fox doing? And I was like, are foxes that... like super common in England? <laughs> well, common enough. Like they'd be like common. Oh, really? Yeah. But but like can't not... the, I can't remember the last time I've seen a fox in real life. Like, whoa, a fox. Right. That well, wouldn't happen in Portland. <laughs> well, yeah, city. I mean, this is what it's like. And you might see them kind of in the back of gardens, but, you know, they've gone really quickly. This one was just standing around, it had nowhere to go, looking at us. Anyway, I was just like, I've created that fox. That fox is my spirit You animal. did. <laughs> that's so great. Um, I have an imaginary uh, creature that's um, it's a crow and its name is Bram, and mm. uh, I named it after Bram Stoker. I don't know if you've ever heard of, you know, <laughs> that guy. Um, but, uh, but, but I do, like, um, kind of, like, weird meditations when I'm trying to come up with or trying to generate some painting ideas. So one of the things that I can do is I also really um, kind of like the, the idea of, like, warging and Game of Thrones, <laughs> where you can like see through another animal's eyes. But, um, but I'm like looking through my own imagination at this point. But what I would do, um, and I've got this whole wacky, weird imaginary world in my, um, that I like use for, for where I create stories and where mm -hmm. I paint from. So what I can do in like, um, in a meditation is I can um, kind of connect with my weird little um, crow bram and I'm like hey go look around this world so check it out see what's going on and then tell me about it so like he can like kind of zoom around and investigate the different cities and sometimes um, it'll see some interesting things mm. that feels really weird for me to talk about it, it, but it life, makes complete but, uh, sense and I can really see the advantage like the benefits of it just because it's going to have a different personality you know like if you're embodying a crow it's not going to have the same like judgments about the world the stuff that we normally carry like if, if i'm me in my imagination because that's what we're doing aren't we doing that every day when we kind of create ourselves we walk around the world and we're like yeah that's something that cat would do and we very rarely act out of character because i'm sure there are various psychological reasons for it but through this kind of i guess it's kind of like an active imagination uh that Jungian idea but you're you're interacting with a world which you've also created but you're not limited by who mark normally is yeah you can also um i like using that sort of idea because you can be more of an observer yes and you can like you don't have to like be interacting with somebody you can just um crows are super common in portland they're mm. everywhere there's like hundreds of them like right around the corner here they just congregate so i'm like well you know they probably see a lot of interesting things so yeah and yeah. they're so smart um what do you know the name of that bird's like not species it, but no i oh, don't okay so rebecca does like you will have to talk to rebecca if you're into like birds in any way she's like really into them oh, cool. and there's like torpids it's it's corbids Yes, it might be that. Correct me if I'm yeah. wrong, anyone who's tuning in. But basically, crows, ravens, um, what's the other one, like rooks? I, they're, they're just really intelligent, aren't they? And uh, when I was in the Pacific Northwest I, last year, I, like, that was a big theme because I kept seeing them and I was like, that's really weird that you just have them everywhere. Like, we have pigeons and where I am in England, seagulls. And uh, one of the women I was staying with when I was uh, volunteering, she, like... It's like, her, I think her middle name was Raven or she had this really like uh, affinity with Ravens. She was teaching me all about them and gosh, they're just so incredible. Um, that's a pretty cool spirit animal, the crow, anyway. Yeah, they're, yeah, around the Portland Art Museum, there are like literally thousands that just live in the trees up there. And like, it's almost a little scary when yeah. they take <laughs> off at once. It's like a force of nature. They're all they're all linked somehow i don't yes. know how they don't just crash into each other but they're pretty cool they're very cool so you've kind of already touched on this but i was going to ask you about how you um kind of generate ideas for your paintings and um for people who are listening watching and haven't seen your work yet you describe it pretty well as like a mashup of folk art medieval painting 
fairy tale illustration. And I, I'm like, yeah, that's bang on. But one other thing that I'd add is like, when I look at your work, it, it feels like I'm remembering something, but I don't know what it is. And that's like a pretty, uh, it's an interesting feeling to, to get to feel when you look at in, like a painting that you've technically never seen before. Um, but it has that kind of, it's nostalgic, but for clearly another world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah i don't really know i feel like the first time i picked up a paintbrush i weirdly had that feeling and i was mm. like oh yeah i need to i feel like i did this before but i've never done this before and how old so did i you... always feel that way I have you been 30. painting for a long time i was 30 okay when i first picked up uh, when i made my first painting but i started drawing when i was like in second grade maybe first grade, maybe younger, actually. I probably drew on the walls at my house. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I didn't actually pick up a paintbrush until I was 30, and I was like, I'm 40 now. And, um, and it was like, weird. I've totally done this before. I was actually going to school for like a graphic design program. I had already done like a political science program. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm not really, I don't know. I was just like... I was playing in bands a lot when I was in college, so my priorities were just like a little bit different. Right, but it's almost later, like, by the by, that you're taking a degree. Like, you know, it's like, actually, that's not what I'm here for. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm here to like play some rock and roll and <laughs> hang out. Um, but yeah, I went back to school. I was going for graphic design. I took this painting class and I was like, oh, this is, this is great. I'm dropping out of school. I'm just gonna do this every day, so I did. Wow. I was like, I'm just going to become a painter, which is like totally not a really smart idea. But I was like, yeah, I feel really strongly. And that was um, that was maybe like a week and a half into the class. Like I'd only done two paintings. And I was like, yeah, I'm just going to become a professional painter. <laughs> that, that is amazing. And like the, the lovely ending to this is you are a professional painter. Yeah. Which. Yeah, it's really hilarious. <laughs> well, it's. I love those stories and I think we all connect with those stories, especially when it's happened later in life, you know, and what's the classic tale of, oh, like that grandma Moses, is that her name? Who was a folk artist, but like she picked up a paintbrush when she was 70 or something. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, Anybody it's can wild. do it at any age. Yeah. And it's mm, that thing of, I mean, this kind of speaks to the idea of the diamond as well. Um, James Hillman talks about these certain characters, um, in history but I guess like now as well who are like so undeniably drawn to something uh and even if you weren't aware of it before it's like when you found it you knew that and it was just undeniable but that's very exciting I like the idea that that exists and uh if we're paying attention to our diamond we get to follow that and you know god knows what would happen if you didn't you'd probably be pretty miserable attempting oh graphic I design. was right yeah I was um I had a lot of like weird mental health issues back when I was about 30 um I was seeing a therapist and um, she felt like I was going through the existential crisis yeah. and I just didn't really know what I was gonna be doing I um I had like a few other like kind of weird sort of um things that led into that one was I was trying to write fiction um right after college and um I got like five short stories published. I made five dollars, so it was like kind of, you know, it was a little upsetting. Um, the dream I worked of the really, yeah, I worked really hard at it, um, and I wrote this uh, novel. It wasn't very good, and I didn't send it out. But one of the main characters in the novel, um, they were a painter, and they uh, painted like monsters, and um, yeah, and I it, and uh, I was also working in a bar too so one of the other characters was a bartender but somehow through writing this novel I became one of the characters in the novel right sort of you know yeah, like that's yeah. my that's my job now is like a character that I invented so that's, that's amazing and and maybe it's it sounds obviously like weird because we don't normally talk about those things but I feel like that's sometimes what we're doing in dreams um especially if you have like a recurring one. And I know that's like often about something that happened in the past, but all of our ideas do start at some point in our minds. 
you know, we have like an inkling about something and yeah, it's very weird how things unfold. Yeah. As above, so below. If you, if yeah. you think it, you can make it happen in the real world. <laughs> And it's, it's kind of crazy how that that works um and it, it makes so much sense as a creative person to be doing that and practicing that on a regular basis um so had you like as soon as you started painting like what were you painting Did you straight away go into like the monsters and aliens? Um, yeah yeah kind of um it was it was pretty similar it was i don't i was pretty intense about it um so a month I started painting. I was like, "Hey, everybody, I'm painting." Um, to like, I was working in a bar, and, um, and I was like, "You know what? I should have a show in a month." I didn't even like have any paintings or any painting experience, but I had like all these ideas. So I was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna just have a show." And I sold every single painting I made. Wow, that's <laughs> they crazy. were bad too. They were really <laughs> bad. They were do, the worst. Do you um, still have pictures of those early paintings? I can't look at them. Oh yeah, Fair. it's so fun though to like just look back at old work and cringe and be like, just deny that that you're ever part of that. <laughs> yeah, but, but it was obviously a success, and that's again very, it's very unusual. Any painters listening will probably be able to attest that that is very unusual. Yeah, um, yeah, I feel really lucky. Um, but over the next decade of uh, painting, I bartended also for a lot of it, but I only bartended um kind of part-time and then I like sort of weaned myself off of bartending slowly um and also it provided you know just the a little bit of security yes. but eventually it kind of became like that was like my bartending was kind of like a side hustle and then painting became the real mm -hmm. the real job um like five years ago, I started working with a gallery in New Orleans and um, that was my, so I think around five years ago, it became like more my job, but then I ditched bartending completely um, just a year ago. Wow. So, and so, yeah. so many questions about like how that even works. So from the beginning, you talked about having a show and Portland's a very, Art, artistic place big i was actually community. in eugene oregon okay um eugene is like two hours south it's a weird hippie college I've town every that. hippie in the world is actually probably can like tie some some weird um strings back to eugene oregon <laughs> um like the grateful dead is like jerry mm -hmm. garcia like lived around there and we have this thing called the oregon country fair and there are just some woods out there and my like, hippies will come out of like the forest and then <laughs> populate the rest of the planet that's where they're from oh wow i'm gonna have to make it there at some point yeah it's pretty far out so so there was an art scene there as well though no there was like no art scene in eugene oh. there were just like weird hippies and um the art scene was more up in portland but i didn't really know um I didn't really know very many other artists in Eugene. So eventually I did move back to Portland. I'm from here. I went to college down there and lived there for like 15 years. So. so so getting the first art show, I mean, if you can recall that, like, was it just a matter yeah. of the gallery? And... That was just starting to work in bars. Um, okay. I just would um, show in the bars in Eugene and uh, sell the paintings for pretty cheap. And then, um, and then I started talking to more like legitimate galleries in right. Portland. And um, I started like mailing my paintings up or taking them up on the bus or train. Mm -hmm. And um, I did that for a little while and then moved up, up to Portland. And I started showing it some of the galleries up here. And then um, I joined like a co-op gallery for a while. That was pretty cool. Um, but I didn't last very long because I'm, pretty independent i like mm -hmm. to do my own thing um and then i start and then i went down to new orleans just for fun and i saw a bunch of my portland friends in this gallery um it was called red truck gallery and um, i was like whoa that's crazy that's totally like a portland place so i went in there and talked to them and they invited me for a group show and i showed one group show with them and then i started shipping my paintings to them um, like every painting I made, I would just ship to them. I haven't shown in Portland in forever, actually. Um, and then 
<clears throat> they would do all these shows around the country, that gallery. So like they would do the LA art show. They would do um, this uh, scope art in Miami, I think. Um, and like shows in New Orleans. And then they would like team up with other galleries. So um, through them, I got to show in New York and um, just around, just like all over the US. Um, that was pretty cool. And, um, but recently I stopped working with galleries entirely. Mm -hmm. It's my new plan. Um, I just sell everything online now and that yeah. has worked better for me than anything. That's wild. Um, yeah. Um, How long the, have you been building the online stuff for? Two years, no, three years, really, really heavily three years. And then that's allowed me to, to not, um, to not work, but I mean, or to not bartend yeah. and have to rely on that. But, um, but yeah, the online thing is just 100%. It's been way better than everything. Amazing. And are most of like your customers, are they based in the States? Is it like worldwide? Um, uh, for prints, it's really worldwide. Um, like uh, sometimes it's really hard because I speak English barely. Like I have a hard <laughs> time with my own language and like, right. So, so I was just, just a minute ago, I was talking to a guy who's in Mexico and, uh, it's really hard sometimes to, to communicate, um, yeah. you know, um, with, with me maybe shipping to the wrong address or something right. like that by mistake or, you know, just filling out the shipping form, but sorry, I went on a tangent, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, um, they, mainly prints are prints are worldwide and mainly in the u.s for paintings but i've shipped paintings pretty worldwide too wow and yeah like obviously there's like a convenience to that but you kind of mentioned you know it's hard you're shipping this yourself currently mm -hmm. and have you ever i don't know too much about them but like other websites that sell art on your behalf you, you never kind of looked into anything like that, even in the intermediary stage? No, I'm, I've am i looked into like print on demand, like mm. print places, but right. I do everything DIY. Like I have my own archival printer. I make all my own oh. prints. Um, yeah, I don't, I try not to really rely on um, a lot of other outside sources. Yeah. I think that's a big appeal for customers as well like instantly there's something about that like the, the artisan yeah I, I kind of started realizing that I needed to do my own thing because um I would be showing in a gallery and then I would have some collector who would uh, message me and they would be like hey I'm interested in buying you know this painting I'd be like oh yeah that's cool thank you so much um here's the gallery's contact info and then sometimes it'd be hard for them to reach the gallerist mm -hmm. because you know the gallerist has like 20 30 other you know artists that they're working with so like i can imagine their inboxes are super intense mm -hmm. um it sucks to not work with them because all gallery owners are awesome people or at least i've only worked with really awesome people mm -hmm. but i feel like i can provide the collector with with pretty much instantaneous um, communication and I can, you know, really tell them what's going on without mm -hmm. having them deal with a middleman. Yes. Also the commissions are really intense too, like 50% with every gallery. Mm -hmm. So I would have to work, I was working like twice as hard um, yeah. as far as like the, the originals go. So yeah. that's interesting. But would you say that, working with the galleries was helpful for establishing your presence like and you know. how to conduct myself too they mm -hmm. um watching how they were um, interacting with collectors yeah. has really helped me and figuring out you know just how i can provide good good service and you know yeah kind of thing. it sounds like when i was um my stint as a designer in an agency it was really helpful for me those early years to see what like the director and everyone like how they were dealing with clients and I was also encouraged to an extent when I was trusted to deal with clients but a lot of people um 
whether they're designers or illustrators who are working for an agency or a, a business, they don't get to see that. So when it comes to working, um, if, if they want to work as solopreneurs, freelancers, uh, it, it can be quite challenging. So like, if, and similarly for an artist, right? If, if you don't have that experience with the gallery side of things, and then you try to go straight and skip that, you might be missing something. Yeah, I've, I've learned it's learned so much by working with them initially, and I learned a lot by um, just jumping into Portland and making friends with the other artists mm -hmm. around here um, and just seeing what they're doing and how, you know, getting, a, even though we don't hang out a lot, you know, I have a lot of artist friends up here, but we're all super busy. And we're all doing our own thing and we're all probably like weird introverts. Maybe they <laughs> listen to your podcast too. I was going to say, like, there are going to be some introverts there, right? Hey, friends. <laughs> <for listening. laughs> but anyway, but yeah, being around um, other artists who are like, you know, professionals um, really helped, helped me. I learned a lot from my peers. Was that ever difficult? Because, I mean, this is something that I, I've talked about on the show, but only realizing relatively late that uh how important it was to kind of have some kind of creative community that you could tap into a community of peers uh, whether it's ideally in person even though it's not it doesn't sound ideal for introverts um so like how obvious was that to you as a hardcore introvert that talking to other artists would be helpful um I, it didn't really even occur to me until it was happening right. until I was like actually hanging out with other artists or even like going into like when I was in Eugene, I was like totally isolated and just painting for like maybe five, five years without mm -hmm. going to actual galleries. Um, so I remember like once I brought a painting up from Eugene, it was like a group show and I was painting really huge back then. Um, just because, because I lived in like a little bit larger place cause it wasn't in the city. So I brought this painting that was like 30 by 40 and to this gallery that was like the smallest gallery I've ever been in. It was maybe smaller than my apartment. My apartment's like <laughs> 350 square feet. This gallery must've been like 200 square feet. So I bring this giant painting in there and all the other paintings in there are super small. I, was I, was like, like, I guess we'll put it on the ceiling. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. And I was like, wow, I guess, you know, being in the place, you know, being being actually in it versus looking at everything online is pretty helpful. Yeah. So. Yeah. There is something about that. Like you have to kind of take stock of what else is happening um, in and sometimes that's like debilitating. Like I was kind of thinking about this recently of a when is when is it time to you know like really look around see what your peers are doing speak to them ask for ideas versus when is it time to be the hermit and just like get to it um it seems like it's a balance how have you experienced I'm hermit that? now <laughs> now I'm definitely the hermit you, you've but, achieved um, you've won the hermit cards basically <laughs> yeah no I'm actually um this sounds super woo-woo, but we'll get into it. I'm actually going into my year of the hermit, numerology-wise. Um, I was I've I've been taking tarot classes lately, and um, yeah, we'll have to exchange because um, weirdly, tarot is something that I've tried to learn a bit about it, and I really love how it ties into astrology. But I still haven't really managed. Like I just forget everything. Um, I'm the opposite. I can't uh, astrology. I I know there are planets up there. <laughs> I mean, I, I paint so. aliens, I so. yeah. <laughs> but I don't know anything about you know like what my, I mean, I my rising sign. What is that? Who knows? Oh, you do. Mark, we need you know, to discuss just, like, this. <laughs> I'm an Aries, but I don't even know if like that's about it. That's all I know. Okay, okay, fellow Aries here. Well, I can tell you all about that. Oh, but, cool. Um... High five. Sweet. <laughs> But um, so, but you're saying that with tarot, you've instantly kind of connected with that, and you're able to, yeah, like remember the meanings of these cards. That was exactly like painting. Actually, that was one of those things that I did. I haven't done very many of those things. That was like instantly, like I 
bought a deck, I pulled them out, I started really looking at them. I'd had a couple of readings like in the past, but I started pulling them out and I was like, whoa, I did this. Like wow. I've done I've definitely done this before. But I'm also wondering if it's like the layout of how the cards are all put together, if they're um, you know, they are ancient archetypes, yeah, you know, that are buried within like the human subconscious. And I was wondering if I was like tapping into that. Or if I want to get even crazier, I could be like, yes, you did tarot in a past life. No, yeah, yeah it's like, well, what, what, what is more fun to believe? I think it's the latter, right? <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder also if it's that aspect of storytelling, because if I understand oh, yeah. it right, like the tarot does tell a story and this is what your work is doing. So I can see why. Yeah. You know. And I use it. I use tarot to create story ideas all the time, too. And I use it for all kinds of different creative things. It's a really great tool. Can you give us an example of that? Um, I think my last couple of paintings came from tarot spreads, probably. So you probably p- like, yeah. Would you do like the, the three like beginning, middle, and ends? I mean, that would be the first thing I think um, of. No, I um. So I was reading a um a book on just writing. I can't remember what the what the um, author's name is right now but they broke it down and they were like okay a story has elements like they have every story has a character Um, they've got your main character they've got your conflict they've got your setting they have an emotion and maybe a theme so I would make those be my tarot slots and I would have to work with it that way but okay, you can do that's... it. You you can do all. You can slot it out however you want. But, but that's just one way to get the brain turning a little bit. I Definitely. find that there's a lot of creativity that happens when you limit your ideas. Mm. Um, having too many ideas really like kind of fucks up the creative process yeah. for me. But having like a limited structure to work with makes me more creative. That's why I paint like only in like a pioneer setting. Um, in a pioneer world. I chose that like pretty early on. I just only wanted to, um, there's so many options as far as like painting people. I could paint people like in a modern world with like Nikes on. I could paint like medieval people. I could paint, you know, anything. So I just really tried to like limit down some of those ideas to have like more freedom within the form. Yeah. No, that was something I was thinking about um, with your work, like, and part of potentially why it's so successful is that it is consistent. You've got this, you've created this world. And this is also what we marvel at when we watch Game of Thrones or read Game of Thrones, um, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, like they're they're these really consistent worlds. Um, And I think definitely when I was uh, illustrating, uh, I, I could never do that. I was just always torn between these different worlds and like I'd have like a really cute little character and then like this big demon thing and like never the two shall meet. Like there was no one place that they could have met. But in your paintings, I guess all of those characters could or maybe have met. Yeah, there's a world in my head called mm. the Southwestern Bellows. <laughs> and I have a map drawn for it and everything. And uh, there's a bunch of different little towns. And um, it's kind of like if you were to take Oregon and Southern California and Arizona, but mash them all in together, like on the West Coast, just make them all really close and make it about um, maybe 800, maybe the late 1800s mm-hmm. would be when it took place, except. There are also wizards mm-hmm. and aliens and um, well, these and are timeless pi- interacting with pioneers. Yeah. Well, that's why I mean because you can bring it, the, the whole thing is if you would if you weren't painting like fantasy stuff, um, it might be a little bit dull. It'd be like okay, that that's you know you yeah. can see what you're doing there. But with that element of fantasy, you get to have that play, um, and also if you didn't have the realistic world, like you said, it would just be all over the place and it, it, there would be nothing to tie all of the fantasy elements together. I was, I've always kind of thought of it like, like I'm really into fantasy actually more than science fiction, mm-hmm. um, even though aliens are kind of sci-fi, but um, like these fantasy worlds like um, that you would read in your typical fantasy novel is like, is it kind of like 
has a medieval setting with like magic and all that kind of stuff. Well, I'm trying to do the exact same thing, except my, I'm doing it from, um, from like an American perspective, yes. I guess. Um, and instead of looking back to like early um, British yeah. or English or like or even German, you know, the, like, I'm thinking about like yeah, yeah. Mine mine takes place with um, with pioneers. Yeah. And instead of like elves and fairies or stuff like that, I'm using aliens because they're the version of they're almost like the American version of that. Yeah, that's so interesting. So I've never made that I, connection. I do that and I think of them not really as like I'm inspired barely by like the Roswell and sure. like you know UFOlogy stuff but I think of them as as elves yeah and like um they they abduct people just like elves do they I don't know they might be good they might be bad right the trickster know. it's that yeah, kind of trickster. and then I try to have fun with them in my paintings they um they eat gold they're really into cactus. Um, they steal people's dreams because they can't have their own. I have a gigantic mythos about them that I've created. That's they're, they're so really cool. scary to me. Do, have you, I mean, I mean, just putting ideas out there. First of all, I want to see that map being published. I think like that would be a really it's cool on my thing. It's Instagram. That... I oh, it is? drew it out really badly though, but, but it's out there. I'm going to redraw it a little bit better. I also have a language or an alphabet of the aliens that I wrote out to. It's called Parodia. Okay. And that's, um, Parodia is a really tiny little cactus. And it also means parody in Spanish. So it's like, it's that's kind of brilliant. a joke. No, I, I want to see that. Do you have like tattoos of it with it yet? So that, that's no. the next step. Soon you're going to have people doing that, right? Cause I've had a couple perfect. people tattoo my art on them. Amazing. Which I think is cool because I was going to, that was another one of my weird career options that I wanted to try is I, would, I got a tattoo apprenticeship, but I couldn't afford to pay for it. Oh. I'm glad it didn't work out. So. <laughs> well, you would just be doing what you're doing now, but you'd be doing it on people. Um. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing I was thinking about would be a book, you know, like kind of not necessarily telling the story, but like you would have the story <clears throat> in it and with the paintings. Yeah, I'm working on that right now, actually. Um, I was thinking about doing a novel um, that had like 20 paintings in it. So it's like a heavily illustrated book. Right, yeah. um, I'm plotting it out slowly. I need to read. I can't remember your guest name, but she wrote the INFJ writer. Yes. Um, Lauren Zappala. But yeah. yeah, I need to read like, her That would have been embarrassing I if I'd forgotten. <laughs> Oh God, Mom! Yeah. Don't put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, but yeah, I have. I'm good at writing, and I'm horrible at writing at the same time. So, so yeah. No, that, maybe that, I'm just better at painting. Just I, I think, from the sounds of it, like you don't have to be the best writer because your story is already there. Like the characters are there. Um, you know what I mean? It's like a lot of fantasy writers aren't the best writers, but they're telling the best stories. So there's that. Um, yeah. if, if, if those words are any comforts, basically, I want to see the book um, as soon as possible. I was going to ask you, have you always been into the sort of weird occultist, esoteric, alien stuff? Yeah, I remember when I was, um, my mom took me to the library when I was really, really young. And I got a book on astral projection. <laughs> and I started doing like astral projection exercises when I was like, eight or something no. <laughs> I was like trying to um you know open up my crown chakra when I was like a little kid I was also raised Catholic too so um so I would be in Catholic church trying to like blow out all the candles with my mental powers <laughs> but it never worked well it's so funny because it's great that we because we could kind of talk about the Catholic thing a bit I feel like um that there are so many interesting <clears throat> symbols and images that come from the catholic church which i mean have you, do you pull that in ever i feel like um i try not to pull in um like really catholicism based stuff more more pagan yeah or, or um like witchcraft elements like currently in my paintings 
However, stylistically, I'm so in love with um, the Northern Renaissance painters who paint, painted really, um, really uh, Christian Catholic paintings. Like, yeah, and some of them are pretty scary, like so dramatic. Yeah, I love them. Me too. And I remember I was in, where was I last year? in some country i was in porto and just i was in one of the very very like elaborate i'm not sure what style it was in um but some of those churches it it it, it feels like a fantasy world it's like did humans really think that this would be a good way to like um be, like i don't know honor god it, it just seems so strange like where did this come from um but that whole like mystical I don't know. It's, it, that's an interesting world in itself. I wonder what kind of influence that would have had on you as a kid. Yeah. Yeah. My stepdad was, um, he was in the Franciscan Brotherhood before he met my mom. So pretty, pretty Catholic. Yeah. Um, I always wanted to, whenever, when I was in church as a little kid, I always wanted them to talk about the super exciting stuff like exorcism. Right. Yes. But it was never about exorcism. That was <laughs> yeah. what I was really into. I was like, I want to talk about demons. Yeah, I want to yeah. know about the hierarchy of angels. Like, please show yes. me the map. Show me the hierarchy. I want to know about all the weird magic stuff, which is kind of like I started reading about more of that stuff when I was like, you know, a teenager. And I would read about like Golden Dawn yeah. type, um, like, like, christian or catholic mysticism stuff and summoning demons and all that kind of thing it's such but, a weird um, world that yeah. i mean like the rosicrucianism yeah that something that came up yeah yeah didn't you talk about that in, in yeah. the crowley episode and i'm embarrassed because like I, I, rebecca's much better at the research end of things i'll sort of read something and like instantly forget it so i'm like i kind of remember some things but for me uh it was the stuff that came from like, cause I know that I mentioned Yates a bit in that episode and yeah. it was just really gripping. Like when, you know, when you like dive into a bit of history and you're like, like, I feel like I relate to this person and I want to understand their world more. And it just badly made me want to be alive at that time of the golden dawn, just to kind of witness what the hell were they doing? Just like the, the visuals of the whole thing. Um, and just reading Yates's very strange writings. You know, yeah. Anyway. It was I was just reading recently um, um, because I've been in these uh, tarot classes. So I was, um, I used the Rider Waite deck. And, um, I was going to ask about that. Right. Yeah. And, and A.E. Waite was um, one, of the, one of the top people in the Golden Dawn or like one of the um, key members back in the day. And, uh, and I was just reading about how McGregor Mathers, mm. who's one of the founders, was coming up with the Golden Dawn Tarot, not the Rider Waite deck, but the Golden Dawn Tarot, and how he and his wife Mona Mathers were doing, they were channeling the secret chiefs in order to come up with um, the meanings behind some of the cards, or I don't, I mean, I wasn't there, so I can't really but wouldn't, it just make describe you, it. But yeah, being yeah. there and like being around these people, what if they were my peers? I'm just yeah. like, whoa, you were just talking to the secret chiefs? That's great. Tell me more. And, and like, imagine if they were doing that all today. Like, it would just all be on Twitter. Um, they would like, Crowley would have a massive YouTube channel. Like, it, it would be amazing. Basically, what they need to do, somebody needs to make a film of that period in time. And tell some of those stories because oh my god especially so the crowley great. stuff is so strange yeah yeah oh i'm so surprised they haven't made a real life crowley movie oh yes. my god that'd be so good yeah especially wow. when it gets to the bit with like is it jack is his name jack parsons Sorry. um the the kind of the rocket scientist the bit. rocket scientist all of that oh, stuff whoa. <laughs> yeah that's got to be a movie too <laughs> I'm like, it's so, so, so many of the neat. creative introvert listeners right now are just like, what, what, what are they talking about? <laughs> it's great yeah. stuff. It's so interesting. I don't care if you're like not into the esoteric stuff. Like, it's just a fascinating period in history. Um, also, think. some of it has really improved my life, um, which is just so weird, even though it was just like originally like kind of a bizarre fascination. Yeah. Um, some of it has made my life better um, in the way just doing tarot yeah. to begin with has really um, 
helped me like connect with my higher self to be yes. real cheesy. But, um, but you know, I feel that I can unlock truths that I already know in my subconscious by asking myself these questions and using magical thinking. I'm able to solve my own problems or figure out what my true project, my true traje- trajectory really is in some of these cases. So yeah. that sounds incredibly similar to my experience with astrology. Like regardless of like what's really going on with astrology, which is very confusing and bizarre, um, how it's impacted my life and like how I see the world, how I see myself. Yeah. It's, it's, it's wildly, wildly helpful. Um, and one, okay, we're getting, we need to wrap up shortly, but um, yeah, I was, have you ever heard of Sabian symbols? No. This is something you might be interested in. I'll, I'll link to something okay, cool. after the show, but people have been putting kind of strange images to various parts of the Zodiac. Um, and I wonder if like similar to the tarot, this would be a way of like generating ideas uh, that might feed into your work, but it, it just came to mind. I was wondering if you'd um, come across that. No, is it like alchemical or like... I, I don't know enough about it, but I just know that it was like just channeled like some woman in the, I want to say the early 1900s, I could be wrong, um, just kind of had this download about every single degree, 360 degrees of the Zodiac, and she and maybe a, a bloke ascribed it to um, a different image. But if you look up the images, they're very, very strange and probably up your street. <laughs> I also definitely need to hit you up for some astrology texts, like some yes. recommendations. Like if I want to learn that stuff, I would like to. Yeah. And you where, probably, do I, where do I start? Definitely. I'd certainly will. And probably, you'd probably be interested in like the magical stuff as well. There's a lot of, oh, it's yeah. like a whole area of magical astro- astrology and yeah, it's a, it's a huge world. We'll, we'll exchange astrology and tarot uh, knowledge at some point. <laughs> cool. But Mark, so what's next for you? Like you talked a bit about the book, like you kind of keeping on, keeping on. What's the plan? Yeah, yeah, keeping on, keeping on. Um, I feel that um, that what works best for me is to just figure out systems and like routines, mm-hmm. and trying to just tweak them and dial in the best system for me. So I have like a pretty. <clears throat> so everything is just kind of on autopilot. Maybe that's maybe that's weird, but I just find like that my routine makes everything else possible for me. Um, like I have a pretty good painting schedule and um, um, yeah, just keep on keeping on, I guess. That sounds a lot like what I do. I think um, not every, I've well, I probably out. learned a lot of this stuff <laughs> by listening to you and listening to your episodes. Well, it's, it's, thank you. It's been interesting because I know that I talk a lot about routine and I know it's just not for everyone. I know that there are a lot of other creatives who prefer way more fluidity and spontaneity but uh like you said that idea of kind of having your routine tweaking it over time creating a container so that just like we do with your paintings like the the world that everything exists in there has to be a container for that and then you can play within it Mm -hmm. yeah i have a really great morning routine a really great night routine and even a really great work routine and i feel like you are very pivotal you know, like these podcasts that you've been putting out for me to, to, to have created those. So thanks. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that like my hammering the routine thing home actually worked with somebody. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. So Mark, where can people find you online? Um, my website is um, www.markrogersart.com and I'm on Instagram at Mark Rogers Art. And yeah. Or you can just Google Mark Rogers artist and you'll find me. That's awesome. I can't wait for people to check out your work and uh, yeah, definitely follow Mark on Instagram. I have, I have a lot of joy just looking at your latest pictures and yeah, hopefully we can talk again soon. Cool. So thank you so much, Kat. Thank you. It's been really great to talk to you.